2020 was, it was, um, it was a time that you can't forget. It was in the midst of the pandemic, and then George Floyd died. And we're in the Twin Cities, so it was like right here. We were meeting at the park, and so we, we would do these services, preach the gospel and serve our neighbors and, and give a picture of hope and unity where the gospel tears down these walls that separate us. because. There is a true melting pot in the Twin Cities. You have all these different languages and people groups within just even five, 10 miles. And so we planted the church and the church is called All People's Church. And All People's doesn't mean just ethnically, but it means generationally, it means socially. That was the heart of it. And being in the Twin Cities, being such a melting pot, it felt to me like that would be one of the most powerful apologetics to the world. The hardest thing is probably how slow life transformation takes. And so when people give, they give us church planters something that we really need, and that's time. Because life change is slow, especially if you're trying to um, plant a church where no foundation is laid, as Paul says in the end of Romans. It's slow work, and yet there is no shortage of people who've joined our church and they're, they're, they're growing in their faith for the first time. And, and that's what's been going on. Someone encounters Jesus and then they go tell people, you know, come and see. And so after doing that for a handful of years in the Twin Cities, the, the world can look and see and say, wow, Jesus is real. And I just, I love that. Well, good morning, church. Uh, when I was listening to the Choi's story, I thought of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and all peoples and all tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. When we hear that verse, we often think of international missions. We don't think of uh, missions in America or missions in our midst. Um, but the choice story is a reminder that there's people of all nations and of all tribes that we can reach right here at home. Amen. Our service is going to look a little different during our worship time this morning. So this time, let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to greet one another at this time. So let's stand, go to those you haven't greeted yet this morning, and then we will continue on in our time of worship.
loved ones, as you make your way back to your seat, uh, go ahead and remain standing if you're able as we sing together this morning. Please be seated at this time. Um, our time of worship, um, we're going to come into a time of prayer. Um, I am, was, I, the, 
let's see, I guess a couple of weeks ago, um, there we go. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I had the privilege of teaching Pastor Joe's class on um, Catholicism, actually. And for those of you that don't know, my background is actually in Catholicism. I was raised in a Catholic home. Um, and one of the things that I actually do miss about the Catholic life is the idea of liturgy or the idea of pattern, the idea that every time we come together for worship, there's certain things that we do. And honestly, I was kind of convicted that during our corporate time of worship, there is never a time for us to confess sin in prayer. So after talking with Pastor Joe and with Pastor Tim, um, in the next few moments, I wanna give you an opportunity uh, to prayerfully confess sin before the Lord. On the screen, there's gonna be some uh, scripture prompts. You're welcome to reflect on those during that time um, or just to pray on your own, but I'd like to just lead us in scripture before we do this. First John 1, verse eight, it says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take the next couple of minutes and just confess our sin before the Lord. Father, as we continue in this time of prayer, I want to read Psalm chapter 32. It says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess, confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Father, we thank you for this time to just come before you and confess our iniquity. God, our sin only just highlights the holiness that you are. God, that no evil and no wrong are in your presence. So Father, as brothers and sisters, as one body, we cry out to you, Lord. We have sinned against you and we ask for your grace. Lord, we thank you for that steadfast love that we learn about in scripture. God, that you are slow to anger and you are quick to forgive. Lord, we know that our capacity for sin is much smaller than your capacity to forgive. God, I pray that if there's anybody in this room that is burdened by shame just of their sin of this past week or the sin in their life, God, I pray that you would just steady that shame. 
Lord, our identity and our freedom is found in you. So help us to walk in light of your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Loved ones, would you stand as we sing one final song together this morning? My Jesus, I love thee. I Let's pray together one more time. Father, we do, my Jesus, we do, we love you. Lord, and we thank you just one more time for your steadfast love to continue grace. God, I pray that as Pastor Joe comes this morning, that you would just speak through him, that we could hear a word from you this morning and from your word. Father, I pray that everything that's taken place already in this service has brought honor and glory to you, and that would only continue as we continue to worship you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Church, good morning. Julie and I are, um, we have a friend and we're keeping her dog for a few days. And um, we've, in the past year, have put our last dog down. And we had one of those talks that you have as husband and wife. We decided that we weren't going to replace our dogs. And uh, we have two cats left. We love our cats. We've always loved our animals. We've always had dogs. We've always had cats. Uh, we've had ferrets and gerbils and snakes and spiders and all the stuff you have when you have kids. And, um, but we're, we're kind of decided cats, you know, you can leave and come back and they yawn and go, oh, you're back. But a dog needs a lot more attention. If you're an animal lover, you know that. And all of our dogs have been very calm, not this dog that we're keeping. It's maniac. It's hyper to the highest order. And um, at first, it was cute. Because you're like, like, wow, that dog, I wish I had that kind of energy. And um, I was in bed a few days ago. I'm sound asleep. 
Julie hears the dog crying or barking, whatever it's doing, to say, hey, I'm ready to get out of my cage. Uh, they kennel him at night, so we were going to kennel them, him at night, or her, him or her, what is it? Her. Um, it, the dog, Keet Kaya, I think is the name of it, little bitty white something dog, and more energy than should be allowed by law in a dog. And it's high energy, and it licks everything. And if it's around you, it's licking your hand, it's licking your face. And I'm like, I don't like that, you know. Not when I have to go take a bath after I pet the dog. I'm sound asleep. That dog gets up on the bed, and in less than one second, by the time I could move my hands up to put my hand around the dog's neck, <laughs> he licked both eyeballs, cleaned my teeth, cleaned my ears, my face, I had my CPAP mask on, or I think he'd have crawled in there. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, I'm like, whoa, God, I'm going <laughs> to. And Ju Julie laughed, I laughed, because I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch that dog. Well, I couldn't catch the dog. And Julie said, you can't catch the dog. I said, no, but I can shoot that dog. <laughs> you know, and uh, I wasn't going to shoot it, but I, I'm not going to shoot the dog. But if it ever does that to me again, now when it comes, you can hear it. I'm just, I, we're all covered up like, oh my gosh, here comes the dog. And uh, so I've been thinking a lot about our pets. I've been thinking a lot about animals because today this whole chapter in the book of Job is about animals. Now before I introduce Job 39 to you, I want to share with you a, 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 an article that I found about animals. And uh, it, I, I want to make a statement at the end to officially introduce my message this morning. But listen to what this scientific journal says. One of the most devastating discoveries to the, to the theory of evolution is DNA. Listen to it again so you know what the article is about. One of the most devastating discoveries to the theories of DNA, uh, to, to evolution, is DNA. We now know that DNA code contains the information that enables the organism, whatever it is, to reproduce, preserve, and repair itself. The genetic structure of every living organism limits the organism to what it is, no more or no less. Charles Darwin accepted in the middle 1800s this theory that variations caused by the environment would, could be passed on and inherited by the young. Darwin used this theory, uh, theory to further postulate or to teach and proclaim uh, that one creature could to change into a species into another uh, or change over time. He even explained the origin of the giraffe's long neck in part, quote, through the inherited effects of the increased use of parts, end quote. In other words, the seasons of limited food supply, Darwin reason giraffes would stretch their necks into the high leaves of the trees, supposedly resulting in their longer necks being passed on to their offspring. Modern genetics has utterly disproved this hypothesis. Now it goes into this scientific statement that I, I don't even know what they say. I don't even know what the words are. The length of the giraffe's necks is determined by its genetic code. The genetic structure of every living organism limits that organism to what it is, no more and no less. It was comforting to hear that. It was comforting that science is now, uh, many scientists are now, and this is a pretty liberal scientist that I'm reading, is actually just coming to a conclusion of what we believe the Bible has taught all this time and what we've thought about. Uh, there was a gentleman that I talked with. I don't think he's actually been to our uh, church. His name is Dr. Clawson. I'm not sure what his training is, but he was very encouraging to me. And, and he called and said, hey, I heard a sermon. Or I, some of his family attends here, and, and um, he's a scholar for sure, trained, has heart for the church for sure. just don't know a lot about him. But he made a statement that was very profound to me. He said, you don't have to commit intellectual suicide to believe in the creation. You don't have to commit intellectual suicide to believe in the creation. We expounded upon that maybe 10 or 15 years ago you did. 
But now, even scientists is understanding that deep within each of us is a creative uh, piece of information called DNA that tells us uh, what we're going to look like, how tall we're going to be, and what our what color our eyes are going to be, and maybe even to some degree our personalities and things. And uh, I want to say to you that you do not have to commit intellectual suicide to believe in a creator God over the whole earth. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Job. Uh, I am preaching with notes, and I hope you'll have your notes out this morning. Uh, I know many of you watch us uh, on the different venues where we broadcast our services. Uh, you can find your copy of the notes wherever you are. Job chapter 39, uh, there's only 42 chapters in the book of Job. Uh, we're narrowing in on Job's first response. We'll get a taste of it today, and then God's going to continue on with his questions. I want to speak on this subject today. My title is is the Creator's control and care for His creation. The Creator's control and care for His creation. The Lord is going to bring in this chapter, before Job, a parade of six animals. A lion, a goat, a deer, a wild donkey, a wild ox, and a horse. He is going to, br to bring in front of Job a parade of five birds, a raven, an ostrich, a stork, a hawk, and an eagle. As he considered these creatures, as we contemplate with him the creation, Job had to answer this question, do you understand how they live? Do you understand how I care for them? Do you understand what I do for them? And of course, Job's reply is going to have to be, no, not in any sense of fullness. We, we don't know who created. We know who created them, we, but we didn't create them. And we know that we don't control them. And uh, probably some of that uh, on the list you probably don't even care about, but God is saying, I care about all of them. Job is going to realize that God is in sovereign control he created them, he's in control of them, and he cares for even the creation and the creatures. Would you stand as we honor the reading of God's Word? We're not going to read the entire uh, 39th chapter of Job, but we're going to read the first few verses. So I'm looking at Job chapter 39, but I'm going to back up three verses. This is Job chapter 38 beginning with verse 39. This really begins this series on the animals. Church, hear the word of the Lord. Can you hunt the prey of the lion or satisfy the appetite of young lions when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait for their lyre or for their, for their food? Who prepares for the raven its nourishment when it's young? Listen to this. Cry to God and wonder about without food. Verse 1, do you know the time the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving, uh, ca calv calving of the deer? Can you count the months they fulfill, or do you know the time they give birth? They kneel down, they bring forth their young, they get rid of their labor pains. Their offspring become strong, and they grow up in the open field. They leave and do not return to them. Church, verse 5 on, six animals, five birds, all these things, questions about every one of them but one. He controls them, he created them, he controls them, he cares for them. Let's pray. Father, we will look at most of the scripture in our notes today. Father, help us grasp the lesson of the animals that are around us, particularly as it speaks to you as the creator of the animals, the controller of the animals, the one who cares for the animals. Father, transfer all that truth to each of us in whatever storms we face today. Lord, this is our prayer in your name. Amen. Church, be seated, please. 
If you have your notes uh, right uh, under my title, The Creator's Control and Care for His Creation, uh, just a further review, I said we would kind of do a two-part review. We looked at last week kind of the, uh, the big view of, of uh, our study thus far in, in uh, Job, and now I want to remind you of something. So we've gone 38 chapters, and uh, Job has been listening to all his buddies, and uh, they've been blaming him for his sin about all this calamity that has come over his life. And Throughout all of this, he's wanted God to speak, and now finally God speaks, and he gives a series of 77 questions that are just one right after the other. Boom, 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 boom. Where were you when I created the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I told the water how far to come? Where were you where I told the moon where to go and where the sun's to go and where the stars and who hung the stars and who who did all this? And we looked at a section and we said God is the creator of creation. And I said we would pivot from that. He's not only the creator, but he's the controller of creation. And he's not only the controller of the creation and his creatures, but he's the one that cares for everything that is in his creation. In my review section under A, in these closing chapters of Job, we're going to notice some things. First, Job does not, God does not condemn Job. Second, he does not apologize. God does not apologize for anything that has happened. Three, God does not justify what he has allowed to happen. Four, God does not offer an explanation for Job to consider. Five, uh, God does not offer one word of sympathy to this grieving man. Friends, as a pastor, it shocks me. Not once does God just say, Job, I know you're hurting. It's, It's surprising to me. Number six, God does not answer the question of suffering in the world. Number seven, God does not explain Satan's accusation or his direct involvement in Job's losses. Number eight, God does not explain why bad things happen to good people or why good things happen to bad people. Number nine, God simply points to the creation and the fact that he, the sovereign God, is the creator and controller of all that there is. Alexander McLaren, in his uh, commentary on Job, gives this, uh, I I think, a a quote that really just kind of summarizes all that I'm uh, trying to make point of this morning. Uh, Dr. McLaren writes, "In in the amazing mind of God, he knew that a show and tell of creation's magnificence would help settle the heart of a grieving man because it would elevate God to the sovereign creator, Job could find security and hope in his creator God, sovereign in providence and power, a creator God that created all, controls all, knows all, understands all, loves all, and is above all. I want to state this clearly, God is the creator and controller of the universe. In His sovereignty, we are learning that God is not only creator and controller of the universe, but He cares for all of it. All the things He's made, all the animals that run around our homes, all the animals that run around our woods, He is the creator and the controller and the one who cares for His creation, including you and me. On the back of your notes, let's study verse uh, chapter 30 in its entirety. I'm going to simplify it just for the sake of time. I want to talk to you first about the creativity of God, the creativity of God. He makes what I call the strong animal, the lion. And you see the addresses of each of these Job chapter 38, 39 says, Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? Uh, God evidently cares about what they eat, and He provides food for them. And He makes this statement in 4 that when they crouch in their dens and they lie in their wait for their supper, it's God who's providing the food for the lions. Now, friends, Job had no ability to take care of the lions. 
Job had no ability to go feed the lions. He had no ability to go in the den and explain to the lionesses, the young lions, uh, what was going on. He had none of this at all. I've seen a lion. I've seen lions in the zoo. I've seen one lion in the wild in Africa when I wasn't expecting it. And I was probably from about here to the back of the room when I realized there was nothing between me and that lion. And I had some thoughts like, man, I wish I had a gun. I didn't want to hunt the lion. I wanted to protect myself from the lion. He looked at me, and I looked at him, and the missionary that I was with, and a couple of men that I was with, we looked at that, and the guy just said, you know, the missionary just said, hey, be still. He said, he said, I've not said this until now, but I am armed, and if that lion comes here, we'll ask him to go another direction. And I was good with the plan. And I watched between here and maybe not quite the back of the room, this massive lion look at us and eventually go on his way. Thinking back, I did not create that lion. I did not have the ability to control that lion. I marveled at it. But I didn't want to be its friend. I didn't, want to, I didn't want a pet lion. I can't even handle a little dog, much less a big lion. You with me? I see a skittish animal in the raven. Verse 41. Who prepares for the raven its nourishment? I, I, I'm fascinated by this phrase. And when it's young, cry out to God and wonder... Without food, when, when they're wondering who's going to feed us, we've seen pictures of birds in the nest with their mouth wide open. And that we've always thought, hey, they're waiting for the mother or the dad to come and feed it a worm or something. But the Bible says, no, that bird literally is crying out to God, crying out for something bigger than itself. Who's going to feed me? Who's going to feed me? And it's God who sends the parent to feed the small birds in the nest. Of all the birds that could have been brought to Job's attention, why the raven? It's a large black bird. It eats anything, anything decomposing, anything of, of the like. Um, I was reading about, ra I'm reading about all these animals, trying to become at least uh, orientated somewhat about them. I read about ravens that uh, would hunt with the wolves, and when the wolves would stop eating whatever they were eating, the ravens would eat the rest. And I thought, well, what a, what a sorry example. I don't mean to counsel God, but Lord, we, should, we should have started with the eagle or something. God wanted Job to know that he even cares for the ravens, the, the scavengers, as it were. And he hears their cries. And I could only think if he hears the, the cry of a, of a raven, a scavenger, is God not saying, doesn't he hear our cries when we cry to God? As undesirable, unpleasant, and unattractive as these birds are, they know that God cares for them. We have a strong animal, a skittish animal. We also have a shy animal animal in the mountain goat. Uh, verses 1 and 2 of 39. Do you know the time the mountain goat gives birth? Do you observe the, the calving of the, the deer? Do you count the months they fulfill? Do you know the time they give birth? And he's just one question right after another. You know anything about the cow? You know anything about the goats? And do you know about this? You know about that? And, and um, uh, the obvious answer to this is no. He, he doesn't really, he's not an expert. Uh, he, he might know that in that day, as this day, they kind of stay away during the day. They're not typically going to approach you. They stay hidden during the day. They come out at night. And uh, I think God is making this point. Job, I, I see them all the time. When, when you don't see them, I see them. And, and I see their needs, and I take care for them. I'm the creator, and, and I'm the, the one that controls them, and I'm the one that cares for them. When we were in Israel a few weeks ago, uh, we were at a place called En Gedi, uh, where David uh, ran from King Saul and hid in a hill somewhere. We were just really within the size of this room. Some one of those hills is where David was. We don't know the exact hill. 
And uh, when I was walking back down, I, I came face to face with a mountain goat. And I mean, I was literally just beyond arm's length. I, I literally was within four or five feet of this mountain goat. I want to show you a picture of it. I took this with my phone. And uh, I don't know what you think when you look at that, but when you're right in front of it, I just got very still, and it was very still. And uh, some, of, some of you were with me. We were all kind of standing there, and I said, hey, don't move. And one of the ladies said, is it, a, is it real? It was standing so still, and I thought, you know, I don't think it's real. And then it blinked its eyes. And I thought, no, it's real. Now, that uh, particular animal is called an ibis. And uh, I don't know what that is. I had to find one of our hunters to figure out what that was. But um, she, she said, where'd you see that? And I said, in Israel, how close did you get? She goes, wow, glad you're here. I said, what does that mean? She goes, well, they can be pretty stubborn. And uh, she said, but if you'll, if you'll make a sound with your thing, they run off. I said, well, that's what our guide did. He goes, watch this. And he, and off it ran. It was a shy animal. We have a strong animal, a skittish animal, a shy animal. I want to talk to you about a stubborn animal, the donkey. Uh, the Bible says in verse 5, who set the wild donkey free and who loosed the bonds of the donkey and to whom I gave the wilderness as a home and uh, a land for his dwelling place. And he goes through all these questions. Who, who cares for it? Who created it? Who provides for it? Who, who takes care of it? Uh, Job, uh, has the donkey ever asked you for permission to roam? That's one of the questions. H- has, he, has he ever asked you, hey, where do you want me to live? No. Uh, there's no truth uh, I think the truth is that you can hardly tell a donkey anything because there's a phrase in this passage about the donkey that is kind of perplexing that says the shoutings of the driver he does not hear. Now, I wouldn't think of you driving a donkey, but I, I do know donkeys are stubborn. I went to a dude ranch one time. I had broken my wrist. I had a cast on my arm when I was in high school, and they let us ride donkeys. You don't steer those things. You kick them, you try to make a move, and all they do, you're just in a big circle. That's not how, we didn't know what we were doing. Maybe if you were experienced, you could know what you're doing, but they, they're kind of stubborn. They, they really don't listen to counsel. They don't come and say, hey, what do you think about this? No, they're stubborn. And as I watched my friends try to drive the donkeys, I pondered it. God says, I have determined their habitat. I've told them where to live, told them how to be. I created them. I control them. I care for them. We have a strong animal, a skittish animal, a shy animal, a stubborn animal. Notice the sturdy animal, the wild ox. The wild ox, the sturdy animal. Verses 9 through 11 says, Will the wild ox consent to being tamed? Will it spend the night in your stall? Can you hitch a wild ox to a plow? Will it plow a field for you on command? Uh, given its strength, can you trust it? Can you leave and trust the ox to do your work? So he's asking this question, Job, do you know how to tame a wild ox? And can you hitch him up to your plow? And can you give him instructions for him to follow at night? Of course, the answer is no. Uh, I think God is implying, but, but I can. I, I, I've ingrained within the ox that I created and that I control and that I care for. I direct the wild ox and the donkey both. He comes to a conclusion about both. I'm capable of controlling them, and I'm, contab- I'm, I'm able to control all, all of the chaos in your life when you can't seem to get control of anything. I can. I can do it with an ox. I can do it with a donkey. I can do it with your life. A strong animal, a skittish animal, a shy animal, a stubborn animal, a sturdy animal. Notice a strange animal. Uh, That was probably the easiest S word for me to find for an ostrich, strange. You picture them, right? Big old legs, long skinny legs, big old body, long neck. Uh, They're a little bit nuts. Listen to Job chapter 39, 13 through 17. This is the New Living Translation. The ostrich flaps her wings grandly. 
but they are no match for the feathers of the stork. Uh, She lays her eggs on top of the earth, letting them be warmed in the dust. She doesn't worry uh, uh, that her foot might crush them or wild animals might destroy them. She is harsh towards her young and if they were not her, as if they were not her own. She doesn't care if they die. But for God has deprived her of wisdom, he has given her no understanding. So what can you say about an ostrich? This is not the brightest animal in the barn. Odd birds. They have wings, but they cannot fly. They hide their heads in the sand to get away from their enemies. They're idiots. Our Tahoe, our dog, uh, that we probably was one of our most favorite dogs, if he did something wrong, he would put his heads in the slats on the back door slider. His whole body sitting out thinking he was hidden because he couldn't see us. He thought we couldn't see him. And I think, you know, he's, he had a little bit of ostrich in him, I think. Maybe some golden retriever, maybe some lab, maybe some ostrich in there somehow. In all the statements about the ostrich, this is the only part in this whole response that God doesn't ask one question. He, doesn't, he just presents all these statements about the ostrich. I kind of came to a humorous thought. I'm in my study. I'm thinking about what am I going to say? And I thought, man, what, what are you, Lord, what were you thinking when you created the ostrich? That's going to be one of my questions in heaven. Somebody explain that to me, but you know how God does. He quickly reminds me that my ways are not his ways. God said to me, Joe, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. I, I, might not see no, I might not see any purpose right now in the creation of an ostrich, but I don't know the mind of God, nor do you. His ways are above our ways. Strong animal, skittish animal, shy animal, stubborn animal, sturdy animal, strange animal. Now look at the stately animal, the horse. Have you given the horse its strength or clothed its neck with the flowing mane? Verse 20, did you give it the ability to leap like the locust? Its majestic snorting is terrifying. It pulls the earth and rejoices in its strength when it charges out of battle. Uh, You don't have to read many commentators before they point out that in our culture, uh, horses are pets. They're like family members, but in those cultures, they were vehicles to ride into war and uh, not so much something to be loved. The horse is majestic and full of energy and strength and ready for battle. Um, It has a spirit that all these other animals don't seem to have. And if God could equip the horse for battle, I think he's saying to Job, I can equip you for battle. If I can control the horse, if I can create the horse, control the horse and care for the horse and create it as I have, can't I do the same for you? The stately animal, the horse. Now, our trip to the zoo this morning is almost over. One more stop along the way. We have the strong animal, the skittish animal, the shy animal, the stubborn animal, the sturdy animal, the strange animal, the stately animal. Look at the stunning animals. And he really gives uh, uh, two birds. Uh, I say animal, it just occurred to me, I should have said birds. Uh, He talks about the hawk and the eagle. And um, he says, God says, Job, I I want you to look at two of the birds in your life. I want you to look at the hawk, uh, this built-in migrant migration system that it has built into it, the eagle soaring above the heights uh, and uh, uh, has amazing sight. Job chapter 39, 26 and 29 says this, is it your wisdom that makes the hawk soar or spread its wings toward the south? Is it your command that the eagle rises to the heights of its nest? Uh, It lives on the cliffs, making its home on a distant rocky crag uh, like a ledge somewhere. From there, it hunts its prey, keeping watch with piercing eyes. Uh, A quote, evolutionist, 
would say that eagles developed this eyesight because it made its nest so high. And then over time in the evolutionary process, it had to develop these incredible eyes to see the prey down below. Uh, I read about the eagle, uh, I, evolution, the, the quote's idiotic now in what we know now. Uh, I read that an eagle's eye has eight times as many visual cells per centimeter as the human eye. An eagle flying at 600 feet can watch a small spider crawl across your driveway. An eagle can see a fish the size of your hand jumping in a lake or swimming in a lake from five miles away. I, I can barely see my computer screen two feet in front of me. And here's this eagle, majestic it's broad in front of Job. I remember seeing an eagle in Washoe Valley one time. First time I'd ever seen one. And uh, Julie and I pulled off the side of the road. And man, we just looked at it. I kind of bragged about it in the sermon years ago in Daniel. When we were studying Daniel. And like 18 of you sent pictures of them sitting on your back porch. I thought, wow. I didn't even know we had so many around here. We've talked about the creative creativity of God creating all these animals. I want to talk to you about the accountability of men, just to introduce the message for two weeks from today. Uh, the accountability of men. Job chapter 40, verses 1 through 4. Then the Lord said to Job, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? Are you God's critic? Or do you have the answers? Then Job replied to the Lord, I am nothing! How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. Look up here. He does this. God asks the question, and all he knows to do is just, there's no way I can answer. God, I cannot become his critic. Let's go back to Job chapter 27, verse 11 in the NIV. He says this to his uh, three friends. I'm going to teach you about the power of God and the ways of the Almighty. I know all about them. I'm not going to conceal them to you. Now here's Job standing in front of the Creator God, and all he can do is be quiet. Listen to this article. A Charlotte, North Carolina lawyer purchased a box of very rare and very expensive cigars and then insured them against fire, among other things. Within a month, having smoked his entire stockpile of 24 cigars, the lawyer filed a claim against the insurance company. In his claim, the lawyer stated the cigars were lost to a series of small fires, end quote. The insurance company refused to pay, citing the obvious reason. The man had consumed the cigars himself. An insurance claim against fire damage cannot mean the same thing as as the fire whereby he himself had consumed the cigars. And the court sided with the lawyer, and he actually won. In delivering a ruling, the judge agreed with the insurance company that the claim was frivolous, just it was stupid. But the judge stated, nevertheless, the lawyer held a policy from the company in which he had, warned, he had he war, uh, warranted that the cigars were insurable and also guaranteed that it would insure them against fire without defining that fire, how the fire came about, how the fire started, and thus it, it was obligated to pay the claim. Uh, this is the New York Times. Uh, to the surprise of everyone, the insurance company accepted the ruling and paid $15,000 to the lawyer for the 24 cigars lost in the fires. The lawyer was rather proud of himself for his clever deed. After the lawyer cashed the check, the insurance company had him arrested for 24 counts of arson. <laughs> the article says, with his own testimony used against him, the lawyer was convicted of intentionally setting fire to insured property 24 different times and was sentenced to two years in jail and a $24,000 fine. The lawyer, this is the last line of the, 
the article. The lawyer was convicted by his own words. Friends, that's what happened to Job. He was convicted by his own words. Oh, I, I know all about God. Uh, guys, you don't have to teach me about God. I, I'll teach you about the power of God, and I will not conceal all that I know, and I know all there is to know about the power of the Almighty God. And then the Almighty God shows up and says, Job, are you the creator? Are, are you the one that controls the creation? Are you the one that cares about the creation? Are you any of this? And all Job could say was, no, he was convicted by his own testimony. See, I want to take just a minute and close this message with some encouragement to all of you. Let me make a thought to you. If you don't remember all the different animals, you'll remember something about the cigars. <laughs> you'll remember something about Job being convicted by his own words. But here's what I want you to take with you. Our only hope is in God's strength and care. Our only hope is in God's sovereignty, His strength, and His care for us. Uh, your notes, uh, is this section under C, do you have red ink? Red ink, yes. Uh, you know what that means, right? These are the words of Jesus and um, I wanted them printed in red ink, and then I forgot to make sure they were, but uh, my secretary doesn't miss stuff like this. Thank you so much. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 through 31 says these words. Now, I want you to pretend a moment that the Lord comes today, and He gets you. He wakes you up from your nap, and He says, hey, I want you to come sit with me on the back porch. And He shows you a lion and a raven and a goat and a donkey and an ox and an ostrich and a horse and a hawk, and an eagle, and all these different things. What if two sparrows landed in front of you, and Jesus said, what is the price of two sparrows? Is it not one copper coin? Now, you don't have to, you can look up here for just a second. I've, I have in my hand, uh, you're not going to be able to see it really, but maybe against this. You see this little coin that I have in my hand? I want to show you a picture on the screen, if we could put that up of my hand with this coin. Uh, this is uh, either side of a little coin called a widow's mite, uh, that coin that you see with your eyes I have in my hand. And uh, uh, if you look in your notes, you'll see that this is called a lepta. Lepta in Greek means thin, small. And uh, in, in uh, Mark chapter 12, this is called the widow's might. All right, so let me, give you, let me give you a statement about these coins. Now look up here for a second. Here's a coin. A denarii, uh, I've always wanted a denarii. And this past trip to Israel, I bought one. Started to bring it, but I want, my atten I want the attention to be here. But pretend I have a silver coin bigger. You could see it from where you are. It was what a healthy man could make in a day's wage. You're young, you're healthy, you do a lot of work, your boss, your boss would own you, would hand you a denarii. A farthing, so I'm not, I'm not to a mite yet, a farthing was about one eighteenth of a denarii. A farthing was two mites or two leptas. So, this little small copper coin, uh, that's this coin right here that I hold in my hand, 2,000 years old. This dates back to the time of Christ. If you bought this coin, it cost you about 100 bucks because that's what I paid for it. I paid $600, pri just proud as I could do it, to have a denarii. And I think, I think I'll get it and show it the rest services, but I'll show it to you if you'll remind me next week. This coin was worth one-fourteenth of a penny in our culture. Worth no money at all back then. And a widow that had nothing, had a couple of these and threw one of them in the offering. Took her last bite and threw it in the offering in Mark 12. And so here's a little bitty coin's worth nothing. And Jesus says, here's these two sparrows. They're sitting right up here. I tried to find two sparrows that I could train to just sit here, 
but uh, it didn't work. What is the price of two sparrows? Jesus, you're on your back porch with Christ, and he goes, hey, you see those two sparrows? What's it going to cost? Would it not be like less than a penny? There's no value to a sparrow, really, in our culture. But he says, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the hairs on your head are all numbered. That word doesn't mean counted, one, two, three, four, five. It means inventoried. So uh, I combed my hair today, and I'm sure another one fell out. And somewhere an angel said, hey, that's four, five, two, seven, dash, B, four. They made a record. Something fell to the ground. My hairs are inventory. That's how much God knows and how much he cares. So he says, don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. So let me tell you four statements, but our time is gone, so I need to be brief. Number one, God sees. Not a single sparrow is going to fall to the ground without your father knowing it. I know it if I find them on my property. If I find a sparrow, then I say, man, there's one that fell to the ground. Jesus says they won't even fall to the ground in the process of falling to the ground. He sees it. God sees everything. He knows. God knows. Number two, God knows the very hairs on your head are all numbered. And, and again, he just knows. He knows when the sparrows fall to the ground. He sees it. He, he knows all that. He knows all the, he's got a numbering system for all your hair, if you are still with hair. Number three, it would be correct to say he sees and correct to say he knows, but that's all we could say. We wouldn't, be having, we wouldn't have encouragement. But he says, guys, don't be afraid. Don't fear. Don't, don't be anxious about this. Don't be depressed about this. You are more valuable to God, literally, than, than, than all the sparrows in the world, than a whole flock. If we just got them all together, God sees, God knows, God cares. Now, I want to I add a statement that to Scripture, not, not add to Scripture, but I want to make an observation. Sparrows do fall to the ground. Number four, but God sees, God knows, God cares, but sparrows do fall to the ground. In his book, A Time to Die, Dr. Kent Richards says that throughout throughout our childhood years, we are protected from our parents and nurtured on a diet of rhymes and stories in which happy endings seem to be the rule. It is a rude awakening to discover it's altogether a different matter in the real world and in our personal lives. For those of you who's who's got a sparrow that is flailing, for those of you that have a sparrow that's fallen to the ground, whatever that means for you, it could be a child, it could be a mate, it could be a, a, something inside your home, it could be something outside your home, it could be something inside your person, your medical station, it could be whatever it is, whatever sparrow has fallen to the ground, to those whose sparrows have fallen, our only hope is in this truth. God is the creator and controller and the one who cares for his creation. Our only hope is in God's strength and care. Our only hope is in the creator God who created all, controls all, knows all, understands all, loves all, and is above all. Our only hope is in the God who sees the God who knows, and the God who cares. And when the sparrows of your life fall to the ground, our only hope is in the God who created and controls all things, the same God who cares for all of us. Our only hope is the God who is sovereign over all things. I just read with a, I read a quote to you. Somebody sent this to me this morning. 
when the suffering seems to be far from over, remember it's only lasting as long as it should. There's work to be done, a will being broken, a surrender being born, a God-initiated intimacy welcomed the moment comfort has ceased. When you want to pray for it all to end, instead pray for it to have its way, to break the parts of you that don't look like heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am confident that in this room there are people whose sparrows have fallen to the ground. It's a loved one. It's a health concern, a marriage concern, a financial concern, something. Father, just take us on a tour of the creation like you did Job. Father, today we look at the creatures and we know that you are the God who controls and cares for the creatures. And if you care and take care of all these crazy animals and all the sparrows, and you even said to your own people, you know, how, you know it really by even that day's standards and our standards, a sparrow is quite worthless. But not one of them will fall to the ground that I don't know. In fact, I see it and I know it. I see the numbers of your, the hairs on your head are all inventoried. Father, let us hear these words with our heart. Don't be afraid. Don't fret. Don't be filled with anxiety. Man, you mean so much more to me than all the birds of the world. Lord, thank you that you're the creator God, the controlling God. And Lord, thank you that you care. In your name we pray. Amen. Loved ones, would you stand with me, please? Uh, we'll sing briefly. Pastor Joey is going to lead us with the team. Let this song be your heart. Could there be a better day than today to say yes to Jesus? Realizing how much he cares for you. Could there be a better day than for you to come down and just say, Joe, I want to give my life to Christ, or whatever it might be. Let God speak to you. If you want to come and give your life to Christ, come. If you want to come give your life to the church, come. What do you take away from this? As we sing, you decide. As we sing, you come. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own Remain standing for just a minute. A few prayer requests this morning before we leave. I'm going to be in prayer for Jerry Roberts. That's uh, the sister to Bobby Stokes. Um, she has cancer. Be in prayer for her. Um, Barbara Krause is facing some medical concerns. Willing Minor, um, not only does she have the skin cancer, but now she has a heart murmur, and that needs to be checked before they can do any type of surgery. So pray for Willing. Um, Kathy Miller, you know Dr. Eddie Miller who usually leads, his wife Kathy, her mom fell and uh, broke her left forearm just above her wrist. So their vacation 
plans have changed and they are helping her mom. Um, Gary Funkhauser, um, wife Sue, um, but Gary, who we are praying for, he is in hospice and he's near death, so keep Brother Gary in your prayers. A mission trip to Peru is going to be leaving this week, so we have several people we're going to be praying for, but um, pray for your um, Peru mission team as they prepare to depart. Also, Annie Armstrong Easter offering is still ongoing, so uh, continue to give to Annie Armstrong. Um, following the late service, we have a ministry meet and greet, and if uh, you would like to see how to get involved in any of the ministries that go on here at South Reno, please come to that, and you can get some ice cream while you're there. Uh, tickets are being sold by the women's ministry for the next couple of weeks for what's going on in the um, uh, upcoming women's ministry event. So the next couple of weeks, you can pick those up in the lobby. Uh, next Sunday, one service, 10 a.m. for our 50th anniversary. Don't forget that. Um, two more prayer things. Uh, mission team, um, Brother Dave, Preston, Fran, Dr. Irwin, Rixey, Sean Manassian. Those are all going to be on your mission trip. Um, pray for them. And uh, we have one more prayer request, and I don't see it up here, but pray for um, Bobby Stokes' daughter, who um, just had some surgery, and she's headed back home. And um, pray for her, um, pretty serious surgery, um, but um, she's headed home now, and keep her in your prayers. Pastor Joe. Hey, I went over to the Funkhauser's house Wednesday and found uh, Gary on the floor in his closet, and unconscious, and... I didn't expect him to be alive this morning, but he still is, and just very near death, but pray for, pray for he and Sue, uh, tough, tough, tough moments. I've been a few times since then to their home, but I want you praying for them. Uh, so the prayer mission team, if you are Dave Stregge, Preston Yoshioka, uh, Fran Irwin, Dr. Kurt Irwin, Rixie Jenkins, Sean Manassi, and if you all come here, we're going to pray over this group. Uh, so if you're going to Peru, come this way. I know we have some in this service, uh, maybe all of them, I'm not sure. And uh, we will see. Uh, I want you to remember that as you leave out on the mission team are prayer cards, so you know how to pray for this team. When do you leave? Friday. 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 They leave this Friday, and um, we have prayer cards out there for you to pray over them, but we want to pray over them. All right, y'all turn around. Let us get a good look at you here.